Uh, tonight, the clocks are set ahead, and the old timers that I grew up in the summers with down in the Ozarks, they called it fast time. In fact, they call it that old fast time. They didn't like that old fast. The farmers didn't like the old fast time. But we observe it here because I lecture 25 or 28 or 30 minutes, and it seems like about two and a half hours, and then you take a break, and uh, five minutes seems like two. So th there are mysteries associated with history that we can't explain. We're going to uh, take a quick, very quick, uh, summary look at Romans. I'm not even going to read most of this because uh, this is the last lecture. Oh, no, excuse me, it's the first lecture for today in your notes. A glimpse of Romans doctrinal treasure is afforded by seven aspects of its message. If there's a seven, it must be true. First, we see in Romans God and his gospel. We talked about that last night. If you look at the references, 1, 2, 1, 5, the obedience of faith, 16, 25 through 20, should be 27. Uh, those, you know, we talked about that all. Number two, man and his need. The wrath of God is revealed. The good news of Romans takes shape against the, the good news of Romans takes shape against the grim news of the human predicament. Number three, Christ and his work. The power of God for salvation proclaimed in the gospel centers on Jesus' death and his resurrection. And that's how we get peace with God. And you can scan through the rest of that. Uh, don't overlook this very profound truth, which was, uh, it's obvious from Old Testament narrative, because there are no perfect people in the Old Testament, but God redeems many people. Uh, it was an explicit teaching of Jesus. It went over the heads of, of most people. But it seemed when Jesus said, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And of course, there aren't any righteous. But what he was saying was, I can't help people who think they don't need me. Uh, you got to realize that you're sick. You got to go to the doctor if you want to get cured. And, and if, if you say, well, I don't have a problem, then you're not going to go to the doctor. The, this comes out in Romans in several places. But um, chapter 5, God justifies the ungodly. God justifies the ungodly. So if you ever feel you're not good enough for God's forgiveness, you're in a good spot. <laughs> because when we realize we're not good enough, then we have the possibility of receiving his acceptance. And as long as we think we're on equal terms with God somehow, then uh, we can't receive the benefit of his grace because we don't need it. Number four, the Spirit and his help. We talked about the Spirit last night, and there are a number of references. And we read one today, 5-5, five, five, the Spirit pours out God's love into our hearts. 20 of Romans, almost three dozen references to God's Spirit come in Romans 8. And we talked about Romans 8 last night, and how the Spirit infuses divine life into mortal humans. He gives guidance. He intercedes. Uh, where our words fail, the Holy Spirit mediates for us in prayer. Number five, God's word and its truth. I talked last night about how um, in Romans 9 through 11, I wouldn't say exactly God, uh, Paul defends God's word, but he does uh, argue that it has not failed, and Romans throughout quotes the Old Testament extensively. And then, uh, I said last night, six doxological passages, maybe it's just five, and, and there are one, two, three, there are five amen passages in the book of Romans. 
because God is true to his word, we can and should praise God. Number six, God's people and their mission. The gospel message is for all people. Christ came for missionary purposes that involve us too. So Christ is the great missionary, and we're called to be on his team. Paul's ambition to preach the gospel is shared by the church through the ages. Wherever Jesus' call to make disciples is heeded. Now sadly, often the church doesn't heed the call to make disciples. The church gets concerned about itself and its upkeep and its health and forgets that it's there to extend the light of the good news it has received. But Romans is a great reminder of the missiological identity of churches and, and hopefully of marriages, hopefully of families. You know, our, our social associations as Christians, it's not that we go to church and we're missiological, then at home we're selfish. But there are ways that a husband and a wife can be gospel beacons. And if all they do is you know, try to be that at church and then at home, that's not part of their marriage, then that's hypocritical. If it's true enough for the church, then it should be an organic part of our own daily lives. And, and every marriage has its ways that you can prioritize Christ and you can prioritize the, the, the gospel mission. You know, when you have one and three and five-year-olds, one of the ways is pray for your children and be good parents to them and make sure that you ground them in prayer and in the Word of God and a godly nurture and instill in them a, a, a Christian way of approaching their issues and their circumstances. Um, just a, a word of testimony in, in our situation, um, as, as the years have unfolded, I, I find myself going lots of places. Uh, a week from today, I'll be uh, suffering on an airplane uh, going to uh, Cape Town, South Africa. And then from uh, next Sunday through the following Saturday, uh, I'll be speaking almost nonstop in Cape Town and uh, then in Pretoria and Johannesburg. And the older we've gotten, the harder it is when I leave because of all that my wife has to, to take care of. We spent one night this past week in the emergency room where my mother fell during the night and, and broke the toilet paper fixture off the wall with the back of her head. And of course, that creates uh, flesh wounds and blood. And uh, it's a very long night. And uh, we just pray when I'm gone, something like that won't happen because, you know, she's pretty much uh, the go to person in a circumstance like that. But we've been doing this since 1989 when she had two little kids at home. And we understand, in fact, it's kind of merciful, we don't all four have to go to the mission field. But back in 89, it was Egypt, and then in 1990, it was Romania for three weeks, right after the fall of communism. And, you know, when you're a mother with two little kids and your husband disappears for three weeks, that's a sacrifice. But we took it as, well, this is our family's mission involvement. And so the kids prayed for me. And uh, my wife has never given me grief about being gone. Now, I've told her it's because you're hoping I won't come back. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I think she does want me to come back. It's just that she realizes this is, this is, this is what God is calling on us to, to undergo. And I sacrifice in certain ways, and she sacrifices in certain ways. And, and all of us who follow the Lord, long, we know that in our personal relationships, we, we have to kind of quit gazing at each other and asking, what can you do for me and what can I do for you? But we have to look toward God and say, what is God calling us both together to uh, prioritize that, that may require some sacrifices on our part? Of course, uh, a, a basic one here is giving. Money is always an issue in marriages. And yet something like a 10% a, a kind of minimal tip, if you will, to God, <laughs> a tithe, 
you know, God requires his people to be generous givers. What does that mean? Well, you know, figure that out. But, but you know, one or the other of the spouses has to often take the initiative and say, you know, we need to give to the Lord and not 10 bucks a week. And that kind of commitment in the long run has to be a, it has to be a joint commitment because, you know, 10%, it's a chunk. And as I said, the gospel gets in your head and then a lot of people find 10% is not enough. You can't live with yourself because you see needs that you know you could address if maybe if you didn't drink Starbucks coffee or, you know, you didn't eat out. So, you know, there are ways that often we can, we can make more means available to the Lord's work or to care for the poor or to give to a mission somewhere that we see needs support. So um, the missiological identity of the church, the missiological identity of believers, that we're called to be a blessing to the nations, maybe by making hard choices in our lives that won't bear fruit for three lifetimes later. And that's just what it means to know the God who is, he transcends the ages. And finally, God's love and its power. God showed his love by Christ's death for the ungodly. Can anybody quote Romans 5.8? God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He justifies the ungodly. Nothing can separate believers from God's love in Christ Jesus. And that's the note I'll end Romans on. The love of God in the gospel. And, and it's such a great love because it involves you. It involves you. You know, if you have little kids, it's great to tell them you love them. But little kids thrive on being involved in things that are worthwhile. You know, like uh, maybe baking. I can remember my wife, uh, there was a certain window in the kitchen, and uh, my son would have an apron on, and, and he would be standing on a chair so he could help. And they would pretend that that uh, window was like the uh, TV camera, and so they were doing a cooking show. And so they'd be doing all their cooking, talking to the window. And he, would, he was really hamming it up, you know, three, four years, just like they can ham it up. You know? Now that's work, you know, stirring and measuring. I mean, that's work, but that's, that's what, you know, we're made to serve. Six days shalt thou work. God put us on this earth to do things. And kids, kids are happy, especially when a beloved parent is making use of them side by side with them. And it may be very hard and sweaty work. I can tell you from having two little boys, and, and sometimes they, you know, they don't want to enter, enter into the spirit of it immediately. But, but once you get them into it, there's nothing like men working together <laughs> or children working with their parents. And God's love isn't just this molly-coddling, oh, you're so special. You know, it's a love that claims us for its purposes and goals and involves us. And it gives us meaning and purpose. It dignifies us. And so uh, it's, it's a great thing, the love of God. It's not just, you know, the, 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 the sentimental, oozy kind of saccharine sweetness. There is this... Uh, substance to it because uh, love is what redeems the world and God's people are agents of his redemptive love well speaking of, of uh, redemptive love and God's people the next few letters are letters to the church letters to the church and from 237 of your textbook you can be reminded that after Paul wrote Romans, he went to Jerusalem. He delivered the Jerusalem collection, about which we don't read anything in Acts, but we can assume that uh, this uh, large party, maybe a dozen men, 
including Paul, and, and probably the equivalent of, of tens of thousands of dollars, maybe the equivalent of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, you read about that, remember, in, in First and Second Corinthians, that the churches in Macedonia and in Achaia in Greece, these churches, including the church at Philippi, uh, churches in, in Asia, Ephesians and Colossians, they had all been, these were Gentile churches, and they knew that Paul was hated by many in Judea, where Christians were being persecuted, the Jewish Christians were being persecuted. And I think not all the Christians there hated Paul, but, but probably a lot of them thought ill of him, because Paul was viewed as a sellout. So these Gentile churches, for years, gave sacrificially so that money could be taken to Judea and distributed to the suffering Christians there who lost their jobs, who lost their families. You know, they were, they were impoverished. So Paul got there, and, and we read about that in Acts 20 and 21. And almost immediately after he got back, he was arrested on trumped-up charges. Remember, he wrote, writ, wrote, he wrote Romans, and he wanted to go to Spain. But what happened was he got put in jail. And he languished in jail in the Jerusalem area, actually down in Caesarea, for two years. And they just messed with him. There were plots against his life. Uh, they tried to ship him back up to Jerusalem for trial, and he knew that if they did that, he would be killed. And so he played his trump card as a Roman citizen. He said, I appeal to Caesar. And every Roman citizen, on paper, had that uh, possibility before they could be uh, uh, tried in what they took to be an unjust situation, then they could take their chances by going to Rome and getting a direct hearing before the emperor. It, now, that was a risk, too, because the emperor could always go to thumbs down. But Paul was, was buying time. And so, uh, at the end of those two years, he got put on a prison ship, and he went to Rome, and of course, that ship shipwrecked, and they just barely made it. First, they, they got to Malta, where they were shipwrecked, and remember, he got bit by a poisonous snake there, and everybody thought he was going to die, but he didn't. And then, uh, and then he went to Rome, and that's where the book of Acts ends, is with him being in prison in Rome, awaiting his hearing before um, the emperor, Nero. Now, it's at that time that four epistles were written, and I don't have Philemon up there because there are, there are not enough words in Philemon to, for it to be part of this chart, but the four prison epistles are Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. These four epistles are written, most scholars think, during his Roman imprisonment. Now, now some people think that there might have been one or two of these that was written in Caesarea in the, in the beginning of his imprisonment. Some people think one or two of these might have been written when he was in jail in Ephesus. Because he says, I wrestled wild beasts in Ephesus at the beginning of 2 Corinthians. And nobody knows what that means. And some say, well, maybe, maybe he was in prison there and maybe he wrote one of these letters from the Ephesian imprisonment. But, you know, the... The most common theory is that all four of them were written from a Roman prison cell. And uh, to start out looking at these, um, remember I, I, I played this little game a bit with 1 Corinthians. What is 1 Corinthians about? You know, and, and, and we got some ideas. Well, it's about schisms, it's about divisions, it's about gifts, uh, it's the love chapters there. Uh, it's about problems in the church. It's about tongues. Uh, it's about the resurrection. First Corinthians 15 is all about the resurrection. All these things are true, but remember we did the word counts, and the word group that by far comes up most in, in Corinthians is what? God. <laughs> when you read First Corinthians, the thing you're reading most about is not man and their problems. You're reading about God and Christ, and the Lord, and Jesus. And when you look at the prison epistles, you say, well, now, what are the prison epistles about? And if, if you're familiar, you know, you, you've hung around the church for a while, you know Ephesians is about the church. Philippians is about 
joy. And Colossians, well, maybe the supremacy of Christ. But then there are a lot of problems dealt with in Colossians too. And so what I've, what I've done is with the help of resources that are accessible to me, I, I've given you the major significant words. Now, the word and occurs more than these words. And the word the occurs more than these words. But I don't take them to be significant words. We don't learn anything by how many times the word and occurs in Ephesians. But we do learn something that, number one, Christ, number two, God, number three, Lord, number four, Jesus. And then number six, Spirit. And 11 times, Spirit is the Holy Spirit. And with reference to Christ, nine times Paul mentions being in Christ. So there are other issues in Ephesians, uh, other topics like holiness or holy. Uh, there's a lot of giving that goes on in Ephesians. The word grace occurs 12 times. The word father occurs uh, 11 times. The verb for love occurs 10, and the noun for love occurs 10 times. So there are things besides God talked about. But when you add up 46, 31, 26, 20, and 11, there's not, a, there's not even a close second. Ephesians is just saturated with a vision of God, and especially God as revealed in Christ. And then one other note here, Father is mentioned more in Ephesians than almost any other Pauline letter, especially for its size. Uh, you could say Ephesians is uh, infatuated with God as Father. So, I'll come back to uh, Philippians and Colossians when we do those books. But the, the first book we're going to do as we move from Romans is Ephesians. And it is time for your 30-second break. Now, it's, it's going to be five minutes, but it's going to feel like 30 seconds. So, I'll see you in five minutes. <laughs>